Welcome to Ordinary People with Extraordinary Lives, a podcast dedicated to the testimonies of believers and followers of Jesus Christ. I am your host, Arlene Spucklew. Welcome back, friends, to another episode of Ordinary People with Extraordinary Lives. I am your host, Arlene Spucklew. Thank you for listening or for watching this podcast. And if you're listening for the first time, welcome. And we're so excited to have you joining us on today's episode. So make sure to follow us on social media so that you'll never miss on any updates and get exclusive behind the scenes content and so much more. And you can do that right after this episode by clicking in the links here in the description. Friends, and if you would like to continue supporting our podcast, here are some of the ways that you can do that. Be praying for us and for our guests as they come to share their testimony. And you're doing it right now by listening. And just make sure to share with your friends and family and also on your social media if you are on social media. All right, now we can move on to introduce my guest for today. And today we have Jack Marino joining us. A fun fact is that I met Jack through my career position at Redeemer Bible Church because she was the uh, social media director when I was in the process of moving to Phoenix. And just this year, Jack, along with Doreen Virtue and Jen Nisa, released their new podcast called New Age to New Heart, which you can find on YouTube and also on the AGTV app. And again, you can find all the links here in the description after this episode. And just a little bit about Jack and her background. Well, Jack comes from a past of sexual abuse and drug and alcohol addiction. She was also in the New Age, uh, the occult, and eventually practicing ritual magic in a Freemason lodge as a member of an occult order. There, Jesus Christ saved her, revealed to her the darkness she was in, and delivered her and made her new. And I've had the opportunity to listen to her testimony before. And let me tell you, this is one that you will not want to miss. Her testimony is just a great reminder that no one is too far lost for the Lord to save and that salvation truly belongs to the Lord. So I'm super, super excited for you guys to get to know Jack and uh, just to hear how the Lord has brought her out of darkness into his marvelous light. So thank you, friends, again for joining us today. And here is my conversation with Jack. All right, friends, please help me welcome my guest for today, Jack Marino Chen. Hi, (laughs) Hi, Jack. How are you? I'm good. It's so good to be here with you. Thank you so much. We've talked about it, uh, you know, having you on the podcast, especially after I heard your testimony, after you shared your testimony with me. I was like, Jack, okay, we need to schedule this. (laughs) And I actually shared a little fun fact in the beginning when I did the introduction about how we met. Uh, so Jack was doing the uh, was the social media director at Redeemer, <laughs> and that's how we met. It was actually through a Zoom call mm. when I was being oh, interviewed. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I was still in California in the process of moving. I was supposed to come and visit Phoenix, and uh, you and Dale were uh, interviewing right. me for the position. That's right. <laughs> oh yes, it was so exciting. And then when we came to visit. It was great. I think you, uh, Dale and Shauna were probably one of the first people that I connected with. And, Mm. uh, you know, you and your husband have been so welcoming and Mm. so sweet. And so, uh, you know, you guys are my new uh, Arizona friends. Yes. (laughs) Love. And uh, yeah, so it's been so wonderful to get to know you and especially again, like, you know, having coffee with you. Uh, I'm so thankful because you, you were so uh, warming and like welcoming me in, mm. you know, like making me feel like, hey, like you have people now out here. So yeah, so that was really sweet. I'm so thankful for Praise that. God. And what a blessing. Yeah. So I'm very excited for uh, my listeners to just to get to know you. Um, I've mentioned uh, also in the, in the introduction that you, Doreen and Jen have started a new podcast, which we will be talking about later on. Uh, but as I do with all my guests, I would love for you to just take us back to your upbringing as mm-hmm. much as that you can remember. Just tell us a little bit about were you raised in a believing home? What was family life like? Um, and where were you raised also? And you can take it from there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Arlie. Um, I was raised in the San Diego area. And I really thought that my family was Christian. I really thought it was something that you were born into, like how my family is American. If you were to ask members of my family, they, they've said, um, yes, of course, we're Christian. You know, our whole family's Christian. It's very like who we just kind of are. So that's kind of how I viewed Christianity. And 
we went or I went to a Methodist preschool and I don't remember hearing gospel, but then again, I was very young, but I, I learned a little bit about Jesus and Jesus was someone who I imagined when I was scared and I learned the song, Jesus loves me and things like that. And so I would have said that I was a Christian and my dad played drums um, at the Methodist church. And I just remember my dad really struggled, but when he was playing drums and during worship, he had, there's just something special there with the worship and I would sit in for the practices. And so I had this, I didn't really understand it, but I understand that there was something important going on at church um, in worship. And when I was very young, I was um, sexually abused by a member of my family, not my immediate family. Um, and that brought a lot of confusion, a lot of shame, a lot of um, confusing feelings because by the time I, I started having memories of the abuse, I'd grown a fascination or a crush on my abuser. And so just had really confused feelings regarding what was going on. I thought it was my fault and that it was something I was choosing. And um, so just a lot of confusion around that. And also when I was five, my parents separated because my dad struggled with drug and alcohol abuse. And although I never personally saw it at a young age, he would just kind of disappear. It was a problem to where my mom thought it was best and safest for her to move us somewhere else. And that was really hard for me because of the relationship that I had with my dad that I thought was healthy or good. I didn't understand as a five-year-old what had happened. I just knew that I missed my dad. And my dad who was very close to me, uh, was in the hospital from, I believe at that time, like binge drinking and just seeing him in that state, seeing him go to um, rehab and then a way back home. And my dad told me that I was his reason for living and that if he lost me, then he would die. And so at a young age, I didn't, I just took that seriously and really took it on myself as my responsibility that I am my dad's reason for living. I need to make sure he stays sober. So I really took that to be my identity. And I remember being at my mom's house and if um, he would call or I would call him before I went to sleep and if he didn't answer and my mom was like, okay, it's time to go to sleep, I would be so stressed. What if he just missed the call and then he relapses because of this and just really taking that uh, responsibility over my dad's sobriety from a young age. So that led to a lot of... Um, isolation from the abuse, pain, and a twisted view of, of relationships and love. And then when I was seven, around seven, I had a supernatural experience where I saw these lights in the sky um, that I thought were the angels of my dad's two really good friends who I'd been really close with who'd passed away from complications with drug and alcohol abuse. And it, it wasn't just lights, though. It was these personal, familiar, powerful presences in the sky. And what I got from that was that I'm special to them. They know me. They see me. So where I'm isolated in everything going on, and I feel like no one understands me, these beings understand me. They they know me. And, and it was just something that I really was excited about and felt identity in, in a world where I felt so discombobulated. It was like, oh, this, this is powerful. And this is, this is like who I am. And uh, I really soon after learned about UFOs and I just thought, oh, that must be what that was because it, it just trying to, pe now trying to create a worldview that could place my supernatural experience into it, really putting my experience as the biggest say on how I write my beliefs. And Again, I really didn't know the gospel. So in all this pain, I really didn't know who Jesus was or that I could go to him or that even in the things that I was struggling with, the pain, the the ways that I was acting out, I could have taken the guilt that I was feeling and all these things to the Lord, like wasn't on my radar. And so I latched onto these supernatural experiences as being um, something that I could find identity and expand my worldview in. And then and I also didn't know that the Bible spoke about supernatural experiences, Ephesians 6, talking about the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. I just had no context 
um, I had no scripture to stand on really. And except for platitudes that, that weren't necessarily biblical. And then one other thing that happened at the age of seven was that the person who abused me was caught abusing a child and was sent away. And I received a call, um, very frantic asking me, did he ever touch you? Did anything ever happen? And I was just so afraid of being exposed of being found out. I had been lying for so long and I realized once I started lying that I'd have to lie more to cover up those lies. And I just was so afraid of being exposed and didn't n not even knowing who I am at this point. So I just thought, you know what, I'm going to never think about this again. And then I can believe my own lie. So if I just say, no, he didn't. And then I never think about it. And he's probably not going to tell anyone because he doesn't want to get in more trouble. So like, I'm just, I can create my own reality. I can believe my own truth and, and I can just like make, make my, like maybe dreams come true coming from Disney, but also just the idea of like, no, I can write my own story in a sense. And so that's where I was as a child. And, uh, what about like your mom also, mm -hmm. um, you know, cause you're, you were talking about the involvement of your dad, um, in, in the church and all of that. Um, and also, did you have any other siblings? Like, were mm. you the only child? Um, yeah. What is like that fam family life like? Yeah. So I love both my mom and my dad very much. So I try to be so careful in honoring them and speaking about it. My mom was a single mom at that point because of leaving my dad. Uh, you know, we lived in an apartment uh, in like not the best area of El Cajon and she worked a full-time job and sometimes – uh, even longer than, you know, an eight hour shift. And there was a family who would watch me. Uh, I, in some senses say they raised me a lot because I was with them all the time, even late into the night sleepovers. And it was actually at that house where I had that supernatural experience outside with the, the beings that I then later thought were aliens. My mom was honestly just, uh, trying to stay afloat, very stressed and anxious, which makes sense. Um, I am an only child, um, so she was just really trying her best, but had a lot on her plate. I remember being, uh, you know, at, at after school care, and my mom would be late, and just the stress of trying to support, you know, a child and 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 have it all out. And your husband is is an addict, and there are times that she tried to make it work again with my dad, but my dad was in this really just revolving door of. Um, being using and then overdosing and then being in the hospital and then being in rehab, then away back home, then sober and kind of on his feet and then relapsing again. And so throughout my life, it was really this, this revolving um, door, but I, my dad really wanted to be sober. It, it, I watched him firsthand destroy his life. Um, yeah, it was very hard to witness. What happens then in your time during high school? What is going on in your life? Um, you, I mean, obviously, you know, they're taking you to church. So there is this idea that there is a God, you know, and but there is not really like a true understanding of who this God is, right? right. So, yeah. So what's happening during the, the your high school years? We really stopped going to church except for Easter and Christmas once my parents separated. And in junior high, uh, throughout my life, I – had really unhealthy friendships, um, really confused sexually, uh, not even just twisted and confused, would gravitate towards friends who were also being sexually abused. I found out later um, two of them and one in particular being just don't even want to talk about how bad it was. But those were the kind of friends that I gravitated towards because I just I felt like I fit in, even if I didn't really get it wasn't really spoken of why we connected. So that was sad to see. And and just a lot of brokenness, a lot of sinning as a result of being sinned against um, in that sense of being really confused and then acting out. And sometimes I'll get pushback or at least when I first shared my testimony, I got pushback because I said like there were aspects in in which I I truly believe there was sin involved. And I understand that the complexities of sexual abuse, at least <laughs> I'm starting to more and more, but 
there really was a point at which I know before the Lord, like I knew right from wrong and I chose to sin regardless of, and that's not saying that the abuse itself was my sin, but anyway, I think it can be um, complex and it's different for for every you know experience. But in my heart, I knew that what I was doing was wrong at a certain point, especially the ways that I acted out after. And so the the guilt of sin and in high or junior high, I really found my identity in friendships. I just latched on to people. And then I started to self-harm, cut myself, and developed an eating disorder. I was bulimic. And when I when I did eat, I was bulimic. And when I and then a lot of the time I just didn't eat or ate very, very little. So I lost a lot of weight in eighth grade, noticeably so. People said I was wasting away, but I liked the attention. And then in high school, I joined the cheer team. And I, I never really did anything out of a desire like I want to do this or this is something I like. I was really just clinging on to a friend or an experience and someone else is doing it, like kind of living for the moment. And in high school, I knew I never wanted to drink or do drugs because I'd seen it firsthand destroy my dad's life. But I realized that my friends who were my identity were starting to smoke and go to parties and drink. And at first, I just really tried to stay away from that. But I started losing friends. And even on my cheer team, I wasn't invited to the sleepovers anymore because I wasn't drinking. And and in my mind at that age, it was like, I know that this is wrong, but it's not worth it to lose everything to me. And so it started with going to parties and stealing parents' pills like Percocet and, and painkillers and then marijuana and then eventually alcohol. And that was like the one thing I really did not want to do because that was my dad's biggest addiction. And But I just remember getting to a point of thinking, I know this is wrong, but I'll go back to doing what I know is right, or I'll be back to being who I really am later, but right now it's not worth it. Finding just still not knowing Christ and finding my identity in people and in their validation. And so I still remember the first time that I drank. Um, I drank a lot of vodka, and for the first time, I actually was numb. I actually forgot the abuse. Everything else kind of, I was always trying to live in the moment for the little highs of escaping, but in that moment, I I was drunk. And so there wasn't, uh, it was just like an, a really good escape in, in my mind. I didn't know, well, actually, I kind of knew the repercussions in that it was the excitement of, wow, like I've escaped, but oh no, I don't want to feel any way but this way for the rest of my life. So that really became my new obsession. It wasn't a question of if I was going to drink, but how and how I was going to get it. And I do anything to get that escape. And so I ended up losing the friends that I started drinking, doing drugs to keep, to dump them for friends that went to bigger parties and did harder drugs. And I was very manipulative and self-centered. And all that I really thought about ever was the next time I was going to get my fix, living for the next escape. And that was really my high school experience. And in high school, I also found or I came across the book The Secret by Rhonda Byrne, which was very socially acceptable. It was like a Barnes and Noble, not like a witchcraft book, but it taught the law of attraction. And that was so alluring to me because I continued having these like affinity experiences with aliens and supernatural experiences that we used to make our own Ouija boards and just craving these experiences, this contact with these entities that I'd known as a child and the idea of the law of attraction and I can create my own reality and I'm this magnetic force. I magnetize all things to myself and I can I can be whatever I want. I I can have whatever I want. I can make my dreams come true was so exciting to me to put a like a place for my experiences because really my again my experiences really were my basis of reality to me. And so it was in high school where I started opening up, even though I didn't know it as new age, really opening up to these new age ideas as well as in my high school, we practiced yoga during PE. So opening up to more new age ideas without realizing that. Just to hear the danger, right? That mm. when we don't 
have our identity in Christ, when we have no knowledge of the true God, which only comes by reading his word, right? We go searching for meaning, for identities, and all the things that this world has to offer, right? Because that's right. like what you what your life before Christ sounds like. You were trying to search for something, you know, you were trying to put your identity in so many things. And I think I, you know, you and I talked about when we were uh, sharing uh, our testimonies with each other, like uh, some similarities, you know, from our upbringing revolving like the alcohol and then like uh, us ourselves falling into into that, like uh, getting drunk. And so either you find your identity in Christ, you come mm -hmm. to Christ or you just fully give your like the Lord gives you to the world, like gives you into your sin, basically completely. Right. I yeah. mean, that's like Romans one. Right. Yeah. It just gives you into all the desires and the pleasures that the the world has to give you, but never finding full fulfill, fulfillment, <laughs> satisfaction. You're never satisfied. I mean, we see it in the world right now. Uh, you know, we've seen it throughout the Bible. We've seen it now mm -hmm. in, in the present time, how people are, whether it's with gender or whatever other things that the, you know, the world is pushing in before them. It's like, that's where they're finding their identity. Not yeah. to Christ. They completely reject Christ. They completely reject anything that you tell them about Christ, and and find like trying to find hope in all these things that will never give them hope. Will never give give them satisfaction, right? And it's really sad to 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 see the you know to see the world going instead of like going towards Christ, just completely going hmm. the opposite way from Him. So, um, tell me then how do you like what happens then uh after high school like obviously you're being introduced to all this you know new things that seem very attractive to you hmm. <laughs> like whether you know like the new age or whatever practices that you that you start doing like what is the course of your life from there on from high yeah. school and all these things yeah well you're you're spot on with all of that and one of the a huge grace of God in my life is that I did not have peace. I kept trying to escape to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next high, but I had no peace. And during that time in high school, even in junior high, I had, by God's grace, people come into my life. Some uh, A friend took me to Awana. Um, people would, if people asked me, I would have said I was a Christian while I lived like the world. And if anyone questioned that, I would pull out, well, you can't judge me. Who are you to judge? You don't know my heart, you know, those kind of things. But the reality was I loved my sin. And I just kept telling myself, I'll, you know, I'll do the right thing later. I'll go back to doing what I should later. But right now I can't deal with it. All these excuses to continue in my sin, not knowing the grace of God, not knowing who Christ is and that I could have ran to him. Really just having no understanding of Christ, having no understanding of God's holiness, thinking as the new age, as the law of attraction taught that I am the most powerful being in the universe and that I can create my own reality. No idea that God is perfectly holy, really not understanding what that means, just thinking I am God in a sense or I have God in me. And then not having a, a biblical understanding of my sinfulness and my standing before God, thinking that that was just uh, ridiculousness, honestly, because my spiritual eyes were not opened. And really, I felt guilt. I felt shame. I just thought I needed more self-esteem to get rid of them. I didn't understand the weight of my sin. I tried to excuse it away and, and take the worldly teachings, not knowing that Jesus Christ, God put on flesh because of his great love and live that perfect life that I didn't live tempted as we are yet without sin, the the gravity of that, of God's love, of, of God's plan in Christ. And then Christ went to the cross, despising the shame, bearing our sin and God's judgment. Like I deserved judgment, judgment in our place. And then he died and he rose on the third day, seated at the right hand of God. I had no, I didn't get it. I would have said, Jesus is Lord. Like I would have known sayings, but I did not know what that meant. And so I was just out there looking for something to justify my sin and to explain away my experiences. And one really big aspect of that was that I met I met a guy who I immediately felt uh, somewhat connected to, or really it was just a next thing to attain to. 
He was a bit older than me. He was a Native American. He lived on a Native American reservation. And I pursued him. And I, quote unquote, I would have said I won him and just became absolutely obsessed. So now it was just him and the alcohol and drugs. And we'd stay up all night doing drugs and talking about aliens. And he would teach me his spirituality. And I just, I felt like I was gaining, getting more spiritual than religious. And whatever little I knew that was true about Christ, I was starting to trade in for more spiritual, elemental ideas. And that relationship was physically abusive violent and um, just very controlling. But I I thought that was what love was. I thought that when he was violent with me, like he was showing me that he loved me. And I, I had no biblical view uh, or understanding of love. So if, if he's doing this because he loves me so much, he's just showing it, like trying to justify. And I went to college. I joined a sorority. My college was in Pomona. And um, really just <laughs> quickly realized there that I wasn't like everyone else. I was hiding in the bathrooms to like chug alcohol or I was hiding away to smoke or hang out with the people that did the drugs. And I just felt a lot of shame and realizing, okay, I, I, I know I have a problem. It's clear even in this crowd that I have a problem, but I'm not willing to deal with it. And I was just very selfish, very obsessed with satisfying my own desires that relationship ended after a couple of years in a very violent way um, because of likely cheating. And it was just a very scary breakup. And when we broke up, I really didn't know who I was. It was like, okay, that he was my identity. Now what? And I spent that whole summer, spent a lot of it in Vegas and went to EDC, which is a big rave. And all these things I wasn't allowed to do in the relationship. I just kind of went and partied. And that summer I tried meth and heroin and didn't even think it was a big deal because of how my lifestyle was at that time. And I lost even more weight. And I was just very empty. Uh, and really just at that point still maybe had some new age ideas, but really just focused on, on escaping myself and partying. And that summer when I went home to my hometown to visit, I was up late and drinking and my friend that I was with fell asleep. So I snuck out of her house and went to this party or kickback as they used to call it. And there was this guy there who the second that I saw him, it felt so familiar, like that same familiar, powerful feeling that I felt when I had first seen those um alien or lights in the sky. And it was like in my really dark world, there was suddenly a connection, like there was something to latch on to. And so I really latched on to him. That night I moved in with him. I just like never left. And he um, was a new ager and a drug dealer. And so he could provide for my physical addictions. And he started teaching me truly new age spirituality about karma, about past lives, about our connection. And I, you know, I, I don't want to downplay how lost I was and how selfish I was. Um, and yet the way basically in the beginning, it seemed like he really cared for me. And then once I gave myself to him, it all flipped to where it was very manipulative, very painful. Um, but I had, I had grown a strong dependence on him and believed that he was basically he basically became God to me in that I would hang on every word and his teachings and believed what he taught me, which was that we'd lived many lives, well, that we basically were each other. We were the same uh, essence or being or soul, but that um, we'd lived hundreds of lives. And in some of them, we chose to have separate quests, but we always were meant to be together. And so I really started getting out of my mind at that point, really believed this. Uh, he did psychedelic drugs. I started doing psychedelic drugs. And at th this is the point where things really go from like escaping myself, partying and introducing new age to really now I'm doing psychedelics and I'm doing drugs for the intent and purpose of contacting entities, spirit guides, having psychedelic or supernatural experiences. And so this is where there's really a shift in my belief system. Now you're with this person. You're 
living the life that he's living. You're becoming mm -hmm. like him, right? Because that's yeah. like, I mean, I, it brings to, to mind the scripture, right? That um, bad company corrupts good morals. And even like, you know, being as a non-believer, even if you were raised in a believing in, in, a, in a home that they were teaching you good morals. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what happens when you associate yourself with people who are doing the kind of stuff. You start speaking like them. You start acting like them. You start doing the things that they do. You just basically become like them, right? Yeah. It's like you become a, cop a copy of <laughs> that, that person, right? So what happens then? How long do you stay in this relationship what happens next? What's the next thing that comes? Because it seems like you just move from one thing to the other mm -hmm. because this one doesn't bring satisfaction. This one doesn't give you hope. And then you're still mm -hmm. on that quest of finding something. But yeah, what is that something that you're actually looking for? Yeah, know? that's a good question. Um, I would have said I was looking for control ultimately, I think, because I – or. Like deep down, I didn't realize that I was looking for peace, but also just some sense of control over a life that I felt like I had totally lost control in from a young age. And, you know, I've heard it said you become like what you worship. And I really worshiped this person. I mean, I fully bought into the teaching that we are each other. And I really believe that the enemy used this lie because once I went back to school, it was like I really felt like I was out of my mind every I would think something really, really specific and profound, and then he would text me something about that exact thing, and it just seemed like we were so connected, and I started reading into signs and omens, and it was like the universe telling us how connected we are because he had gone to another state for, for something and then came back, and it was all – it wasn't just, oh, I'm leaving and coming back. It was like, this is a test from the universe, and – you know, the universe will show if we're meant to be together. Everything became this deep spiritual thing. And I was just addicted to this high of this person. And he um, DJed at, fir at first at clubs in LA. Um, and then he ended up moving up to LA. And then that turned into music festivals that were very much like Burning Man and so now I'm in this culture where there is, you know, very new age, crystal magic, tantra yoga, which is, it just reminds me a lot of the Old Testament talking about the pagan practices and the sexual immorality. Like that was the reality of what I was in. And there were some things that by God's grace, I just couldn't do. And But I thought it was my Christian dogma holding me back from being a truly free spirit and ascending. And I was just very uh confused and really wanting to gain his approval wanting to keep him and wanting to ascend spiritually in order to to have both of those things and that went on for a little under three years and then we broke up in a very confusing way where it was i have to go make something of myself you have to follow your dreams and i will come back for you and you know just keep using drugs while i'm gone to to distract yourself and I love you more than you love me, but I'm going to be with this other person because I love you more than you love me. So I have to distract myself. And so I knew how it looked and sounded, but he would tell me like, you can't listen to other people. You have to trust our connection, the universe, whatever, all these things. So I was so confused. I had moved from my school to Hollywood to be near him. I had just moved into a studio apartment and I was just, I remember it was like a wood floor studio apartment and I moved in and that all happened. And I was just laying on the floor, like totally empty. Like, well, who am I now? What? I'm alone. I'm just waiting for him to come back for me. And I really at that point felt like, okay, this isn't working. My spirit or my Christian dogma has held me back. I want the power. I don't want to just play with these things that people use. I, I pridefully felt like people used uh, spirituality as an aesthetic in the new age. And I pridefully thought, I want to get to the root of what all this stuff is coming from. And I want to really gain the power. And so I really kind of snapped. And already before that, I remember after doing, uh, I believe I was doing drugs and having a supernatural experience because that was very often. But either way, I went to the bathroom, I looked in the mirror and my blood just ran cold because I didn't recognize whatever was behind my eyes. Like it wasn't me. And it was like, it felt like I ran a red light. Like 
just fear. And so I was already realizing like so something is shifting and I was obsessed with the moon and I was just getting really deep into magic. And I was like, okay, but it's not enough because I lost this person and I want him back and I need power. And so I snapped and that's where I just was like the, the ways that, again, by God's grace, I was feeling restraint from doing. I was like, I need to just push past ultimately my conscience and just do it. And so I started really opening myself up to these beings that I had believed were, you know, my aliens throughout my whole life, um, started astral projecting, lucid dreaming, really anything to have these psychedelic experiences. I started being led by these entities and one in specific I believed was Thoth, the ancient Egyptian god, really demon, and things would glow to me and I would know that was the next thing. I really couldn't tell the difference between what was reality and what was spiritual because the way that I was seeing things was just out of my mind, but it was leading to the next thing. And it ended up leading eventually to these tarot cards were just glowing on a shelf to me. And I walked up to them and it was the Thoth tarot deck by uh, Alistair Crowley. And I knew vaguely, well, no, I knew that Alistair Crowley was the most wicked man to have ever lived or at least known as that. But I just thought, okay, this is what I'm being led to though. So maybe he was misunderstood. And I was already being so influenced that justifying justifying wickedness. And so I became just obsessed with those tarot cards, trying to take the symbols into my psyche, dreaming about them, having visions about them. Um, I was led to Freemasonry. I, I was walking down the street, walking to a, um, a physical therapy appointment, and this building just glowed to me. And I just wanted to sit in front of it by a tree and breathe in its energy. <laughs> and I was just like a, cr a crazy person, honestly. I, I couldn't really hold conversations at all with people, but I found out that that building was a Freemason Lodge. And so I reached out to um, a contact a with the Freemasons and I wrote this extremely long, like very new age sounding weird <laughs> message. And they responded in basic, basically I was saying, you know, I feel called to this. What do I do? And they said, we don't accept women in America. I believe England has women Freemasons, but there are these other orders like the uh, Order of the Eastern Star and um, kind of putting me in other directions, which uh, not to go into too much detail, but I have a masonry and Eastern Star in my family line. So I was even more and I was finding out about these things. So I was feeling even more drawn to it. And then but there was this order called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn that I was feeling really drawn to hermetics. Um, just to paint the picture at this time, I was genuinely, I lived in that studio apartment. I had put my own clothesline across the studio apartment with like pinning up all these sacred geometry drawings and visions that I had and things from something called the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. Really at this point, I was trying to crack the code, you know, the hidden knowledge that was out there and out of my mind. And I, I should not have been surprised that I was out of my mind at this point because I was I was recently looking back at these things that I had written um, during channeling, and I believe that these alien entities wanted to see through my eyes. I didn't think of that as possession. I believe they wanted to use my body. I didn't think of that as possession, but I was opening myself up and and wanting them to inhabit me. And so I was just so deeply lost at this point um, in Hollywood. I've seen um some of your clips on social media and your testimony it's like one of those dramatic mm -hmm. <laughs> dramatic one before and after christ because even physically mm -hmm. you're absolutely different yeah you're describing like how mentally <laughs> you were but right. even, like if anyone watch and i hope i can get some of those videos to include it um in in this episode just like um throughout it but uh you can totally see your life mm -hmm. back then, the effect that it even had, you know, how it affected you physically, not only mentally, but sin affects us at times, even 
physically and we are able to 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 see that right now that we're in the other side of that darkness yes. now we're able to see like what in the world like honestly i get chills like when you're describing all these things and when mm -hmm. i was watching your video i just it, it, I, i don't know i i was like speechless i was like wow this is truly the power of christ this is what mm. the gospel does in our life it not only changes our heart but it even changes like how we look in the outside right and yes. it's amazing but your story is not finished yet so you <laughs> get very very involved in this order can you just explain what that is like what yeah. is the order what is it that they do why is it that it's so dark mm. yeah well everything like yes and just to point out because i want to make it clear I had no peace during that time. I was like this empty person running on this like treadmill to find the secret knowledge, but never going anywhere. I described it as a feedback loop. Like I was in this like gr groundhog day or something. Nothing was actually changing. It, it would seem like it was, but it was this mirage. I was just stuck and time was passing and life was going on. And I have this video of me like realizing that it had been nine months since that person left. But that whole time it was like I was in a relationship with this person because signs and numbers and every sound meant something and every number meant something and he was communicating with me. I thought he could always see me. Like this person became like God to me. And so there was no peace. There was just this desperation for control and to find the answer and to get control over my life. And there was also a lot of pride in this, uh, this I don't even want to say love because it was not love biblically, but this obsession with this person coupled with this pride of wanting to prove to be better or get over it or, or something like that. But there was no joy, no love, no peace, just just running and getting nowhere. And uh, it was really, it was like these momentary highs of, of finding the next thing, but that just led to something else, which led to, and it, it, it was exhausting. Um, but so this order that I was being drawn to had a lot to do with hermeticism. And there were these um, people who used to be in it that I started listening to some of their talks. And really hermeticism is, it's, the word comes from this idea of this tight uh, seal And so again, it's the idea of there's this hidden knowledge and um, in alchemy, alchemy was a big part of it. It's called the great work. And so there's this pride in like you have been initiated, you're an initiate into this great work where you are going to gain these secrets of hidden knowledge. They would connect themselves to the ancient Egyptian mystery schools, similar to when I read the Bible for the first time, like in Exodus seven and eight the Egyptian magicians, but but they would tie themselves to them and be like, there are these ancient, you know, Egyptian secret mystery schools. And so just the idea that of magic and sorcery ultimately. And Rosicrucianism is somewhat tied. Uh, these might just sound like big words, but <laughs> Rosicrucianism was kind of this philosophical idea. And then the Golden Dawn was the practical Uh, outworking of it. So whereas this would like contemplate her, like the ideas, hermetic ideas, the golden dawn would go and do them ritualistically. And so I ended up after I kept being, it felt like I was being led to this door for the next thing, which was the golden dawn. But then I would, I, I just couldn't do it. I'd be like, this is dark. This is evil. Alistair Crowley was in it. Um, he was kicked out at one point, but still like this, this is dark. Um, <laughs> But I justified it because there was a cross in the symbol and they said you could be a Christian and be in it. And so all these weird justifications I was trying to make and I was going through scary experiences at this point, the altars that I'd set up to Thoth, um, ter terrifying things started happening. And I, and I was too afraid to take the altars down because I was like, I don't want to get in trouble with this entity. And I just was realizing uh, this, this, isn't, this isn't good. Um, and I ended up, you know, just saying, I'm just going to feel the fear and do it anyway. And that was like this mantra that was so unwise that I held to. And I ended up reaching out. They ended up having a, an order in LA. 
and a man met me at a coffee shop and everything that he was talking about from, you know, astrology, ancient Egypt, magic, alchemy, were all these things that I'd been in total isolation, like being led to and studying. So it was like for the first time someone speaking my language, this is the next step. This is what I've been being trained for by these entities. So he told me, you know, you've been called to this, all these things. Long story shorter, to meet him at a Freemason lodge to be initiated into the order. And so on the way there, you would have you would think I would be scared or like, oh, this is weird or something. But it just felt like from a young age, I'd been being trained for this. Um, I listened to Fantasmic, which is a show at Disney on the way there because it seemed like I now understood the symbolism of the sorcery and just everything was clicking. And how can this be wrong if this is just it's just all coming to fruition. Um, and so I was just excited. And I remember getting to the lodge and it was dark in there and it was an older building. I still remember how it smelled. And there was a lady at the top of the stairs in a black robe uh, waiting for me. And she took me into this little dark room with a candle to not really pray, but kind of pray, maybe more like meditate and prepare myself spiritually for the initiation ritual. I got dressed in a black robe and red socks. And I remember hearing all the yelling because the ritual starts before the initiate is taken in. And it's it's very um, ceremonial, but almost like a play. But the But the parts all have these deeper magical meanings that you then learn the meaning of the play once you're in the order. And, you know, I was blindfolded or hoodwinked. And um, and it was just this ritual that I, again, was so excited to do. But the premise was you have to enter into the darkness to shine the light of knowledge. So this desire for hidden knowledge again. Uh, I had a sword held to my neck. And uh, while I made an oath, you know, never to share anything in it. And just a, it was very heavy in that sense, but um, but I was excited and I felt like this was just the next thing. And I stayed in the order for um, a while. I, you know, moved up in a grade. It's They have like grade, different grades they're called. And I was really encouraging it. Like, you're so good at this. Um, you know, I was invited to something called a conclave where they would, we stayed for like eight hours I believe, a day for three days at the Freemason Lodge just doing uh, spells. Well, they would more call it ritual work and um, invocations of entities, which were demons like Thoth, like Isis, which is an Egyptian uh, goddess, again, demon. And just, you know, I I was in, but again, I had no peace. And it was, I was just getting more and more attacked and more and more, heavy more and more something is not right. Um, and, but I just kept convincing myself, no, uh, that can't be. So I just have to keep going. You know, they would tell you in the beginning it's hard, but the deeper you go in, the more it'll make sense. Kind of like cult mentality. And, um, but by God's grace, well, well, for first I'll say Kabbalah was used in the order, which is, um, like Jewish mysticism, unbiblical, but they, so because of that, they would use Bible verses, uh, Old Testament ones, um, in Latin during rituals. And they would even use like the, um, tabernacle as a, um, they, they would basically take things from the Bible and try to like rip power out of it, basically just blasphemy. But I thought, you know, I've already read Hindu sacred texts and some of the Quran and I'm so, you know, advanced. I might as well read the Bible. You know, they're quoting it in our rituals. They aren't quoting other texts. So it must have some power. Like, um, so I started reading it and I read that you can tell a tree by its fruit. And I really didn't know what that meant, but it didn't matter because now I'm going to the Freemason Lodge and I'm with the higher ups and I'm just thinking like, man, these people, they're nice enough and I care for them and they seem to care for me, but they're just as depraved as I am. They are just as lost as I am. Um, I remember, and I remember they, after we do rituals, many of them would take smoking breaks 
and I'm not saying that like if you smoke cigarettes, you're not saved or something like that, but it stood out to me as like you you're supposed to have the power to control the universe, but you're addicted to cigarettes. Like for some reason to me, it just that stood out to me as something something doesn't something isn't adding up here. Um, because I knew that they didn't want to be smoking. Like no one I was a s addicted smoker for eight years. I knew most people like hate that they smoke. They just can't stop. It's an addiction. So that was um, confusing. And then I read that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. And I, again, didn't know what that meant in context, but it pierced me because I had always thought, how can this be? Like, I really felt like Satan was behind what I was doing, but it was like this weird love affair where I, I wanted to find out for sure. And I thought that these demonic entities loved me and again, this twisted view of love and so confused. But when I read this verse, I just knew, no, like Satan is behind this and uh, it doesn't matter if it's quote unquote light work or we're going in the darkness to shine the light. Satan disguises himself. He masquerades as an angel of light. And a lot of the ritual work in the Golden Dawn had to do with the invocation of angels, which is so unbiblical and they weren't biblical angels. But or at least most of them. Actually, all of them were demons. Anyway, <laughs> um, so then I read, or really, I just remembered Genesis and that it was the serpent who said, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll become like God, knowing good and evil. And that was the lie that I fell for. That was exactly the lie that I fell for. That was the whole thing is that if you go into the darkness to shine the light of knowledge, if you gain the secret hidden knowledge you'll become like God. Really, you'll become God. They taught that Jesus could, there was no uh, atonement for sin in someone else like Jesus. You had to become Jesus. Blasphemy, so wrong. I could have never been my own savior, but that was the promise. And I just realized, wow, like Satan is behind this. And it's, I, this is, this led to the fall and it's leading to the fall in my life. And you would think I would have been like, okay, I'm done, like I'm turning from this, but I was still too prideful to turn. I just thought, I don't know who I am apart from this. I, I don't know who I am at all, but this is pretty much my only identity at this point. And I just, I, yeah, I was too prideful to turn. And then, and I continued in the order. And then one night, it was just like any other night, I even had my tarot spread out and I was walking across my apartment and I was spiritually attacked and I fell to my knees and I had no power over the spiritual attack. And I heard myself, well, really, it felt like my soul was being sucked out into complete darkness and it was terrifying. And I heard myself cry out, Jesus Christ, save me. And in that moment, I felt the peace that I had been longing for my whole life. And I knew that it was the God of the Bible, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who had saved me in that moment. And that all the power of the darkness that I was involved in was, it was not hard for him at all to deliver me just like that from the darkness and to give me peace. And I was also shaking because I realized <laughs> this God is so powerful and I'd been reading bits and pieces of the Bible. Like I just opened to it randomly thinking, oh, like what's this? And then it would say sorcery is an abomination and those who practice it are an abomination. I'd, no, 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 wait, that can't be right thinking that I am the judge of the Bible and yet I was shaking because this is God and I have been sinning against him. Um, and so I got my Bible out from under my bed. I had it there not to read, but because I almost as a, a symbol because I'd been having such scary experiences. And, um, and it was like, I, even though I came to it with all these preconceived notions and false teachings, something in me recognized it as true as I was reading it and I was just hungry and it was feeding me and it was so exciting and I just couldn't stop reading it. And um, it was just so cool reading God's word. And <laughs> with all these other books, I'd read just so many books and they just left. It was like, okay, well now what's the next thing? Now what's the next thing? Like never, never satisfying this hunger. And it was like the Bible was just feeding me and satisfying me. And it was just so, so kind of the Lord and amazing. And by the time I finished reading it, I realized that I had changed. Like who I was inside had completely changed. Um, 
And that amazed me because I, like in the new age, I'd done all these rituals. I mean, I would spend hours every morning, even Christmas morning, like no matter where I was, no matter doing rituals, uh, all these banishing, in, like invoking all these rituals, meditations, works to try to attain to meet God halfway or, or something, but I didn't do anything but call on the Lord Jesus Christ and and ask him for help and have this faith faith in him. Um, and it, it just amazed me how undeserved the grace and mercy to me was. And that as I'd been in his word, as I'd been reading and I would come across something and the Lord would be convicting me of, of sin, I would be turning from the sin. Just, it was amazing. And after, I realized for the first time that I could get sober, which like, it doesn't sound like much now, but at the time I never, like, I thought I was just going to die an addict. I didn't think life would be worth living without my addictions. And I just knew because I had the Lord, I could get sober. And so I just locked myself away in my apartment, <laughs> in my studio apartment in Hollywood, that same one, and just got like got sober and God was so kind because when I'd really be having withdrawals and just like struggling, I would go to his word and he would speak to me so clearly and so lovingly. And I'd just be in tears like, wow, God is real and he and he's with me. Like he's leading me. He loves me. It was truly amazing. Um, so the difference between outside of Christ. And just, it always felt like there's this vortex, this dark hole <laughs> vortex under me. And I'd spend the whole day trying to distract myself from it, but there was this impending doom that I couldn't get away from. And then in Christ, just peace and, and joy and him transforming me, um, was, it still amazes me. There are so many things, honestly, in my mm. in my mind right now with all the things that you have mentioned. One of them, the one of the first ones that I can think of is just Satan is a liar. And Amen. he's been um, you know, in the works of uh just completely twisting God's word. And it started at the garden, <laughs> and you mentioned it, right? Like if you you will become like God, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge, right? You will become like God. Wow, that sounds pretty good, right? Um, and the woman ate, <laughs> you know, she, and that it's here. We see the pride. I want to be like God, right? I want to be powerful. I want to have everything that God is. I want to have all of that. And then again, like what you mentioned also, um, Satan, uh, basically di disguises himself as an angel of light. Mm. Sometimes, you know, we think because we've seen so many movies how they portray Satan, we just think that Satan is going to come like this ugly red looking, scary with the horns and all these things. I didn't hear one picture of that in your life. It all seemed like, oh, they're using even the Bible. Mm -hmm. Oh, that sounds pretty pretty nice, right? It, it doesn't seem like there is a cross also. So he just starts like masquerading everything to look cr like Christian. But it's completely opposite to anything the, of who God is and what he says and his word, right? Mm -hmm. And and then we fall for it. We completely fall for it because it's like, well, but it doesn't seem so scary. It, it, it seems pretty, it seems nice. Why shouldn't I be doing this, right? Mm -hmm. But for what, what we hear in your story, there nothing of the things that you did gave you the peace that you needed. All of that, it was... I need to do the next thing, the next thing. So when you run out of things to do, what are you going to do? What is the next thing? There is nothing else but Christ. And look mm -hmm. at, it, it, I mean, and, and all that we need to come to true saving faith is his word. Yes. It's his word is the one that it's going to give us the new heart that we need. We yes. need a new heart. Yes. In order to understand in the darkness that we are and you know that's why i love like i, I constantly say is God, in this podcast god has brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light and maybe mm -hmm. for a lot of people if they had seen you in the life that you had before they would have been like oh no she's a lost cause there's no one to save this girl mm -hmm. Th that's it she's just gonna die in in the place that she is but we have such a powerful merciful gracious father who is in the business of saving wretched sinners like us. We Amen. don't deserve that. Like we don't deserve 
for God to become man and be crucified on the Christ on the cross for all the sins that we have ever committed and we will commit for mm. all the sins, right? And so that I, I mean, that's why I just love hearing all these testimonies because again, it mm-hmm. just point to this merciful and powerful savior that even mm. in the deepest darkness that you can be he can bring you out of that it doesn't matter it doesn't matter and i I, and that's one of the things that i said at the beginning in the introduction maybe you know people like uh, who come from such a dark background we will be like well this is a lost cause there's no one to save this person but again like the the word says the salvation belongs to the lord Hmm. praise god that it belongs to him amen if you could just Obviously, again, I've said it, your your testimony has like a, a very contrast from mm. what it was before to what it is now. But can you just uh, summarize it for us? Once the Lord saved you in this, you know, uh, at that, that time, how does your life change? Mm. What are the changes that, that, that you know, physically, I mean, like I said it, physically, mentally, everything changes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll send you a video. I just, I saw it not that long ago and I, I looked way older. I just, I remember looking in the mirror at that point or at a certain point and just being like, wow, um, this drug use has really affected me. Like I look like a drug user and just God is so kind. I mean, even my health, like he he's just shown me so much mercy. Um, but something I do want to say is sometimes like it sharing your testimony, sometimes the most helpful way to share it is kind of to like ta- wrap, like summarize it well in a little bow, but it was messy. Like getting sober was messier than that in that, uh, it was hard. I feel like sometimes it sounds like I just say, uh, you know, and then I got sober, but it was hard, but the Lord was with me. As I said, you know, Usually I don't mention the withdrawals and it being hard, but truly like that was such a sweet time in my life because although it was so hard, God was there leading me so kindly. And there was that period of where, you know, I say once I, once I finished reading the Bible, but as I, I truly believe I was saved in that moment when I called out to the Lord to save me, but I didn't understand very much. I understood the gospel, but that was pretty much it. <laughs> and I had a lot of, uh, depth there i mean there's still so much depth to the gospel to man it we could study it for the rest of our lives and barely scratch the surface of the gospel um but there was this period in between where i'm i'm still going to the um go, i'm still in the order of the golden dawn i'm still practicing magic i'm still i'm i'm trying to figure it out but the difference is that once i was indwelt with the holy spirit the lord sanctified me like i i did not remain the same i did not continue in sin because the lord started convicting me of my sin very clearly and leading me and that just amazes me about god is that he led me and he did convict me and he did make clear what i needed to repent of and that was just it, he amazes me. And I found a church after some really like, uh, I lived in Hollywood. So the LBGTQ, it, they weren't really churches. It was, it was, yeah, I went to a church and I was, I was so confused. I didn't hear anything from the Bible. And I was just like, is this what church is? I'm, I, I didn't know. So it breaks my heart that, that, uh, thinking of other people like me, cause I was really hungry for truth, but by God's grace, I ended up in a church plant where the pastor and his wife faithfully uh, took me through God's word in that they took the time after the services to sit with me. And I was like, I I don't get this. And still having the pride of thinking I have secret knowledge. And they were just so patient to walk me through the scriptures, walk me through the doctrine of hell, which I, I really struggled with. And that was the grace of God. So that I finally got to the point where I just through being seated in the preaching of uh, expository preaching and under God's word and uh, being in his word myself and in prayer, like the conviction of I cannot be one foot in this order, one foot in Christianity and, and try to justify sin. Like this is not, I'm not following Christ. Um, and so there's fear with leaving because they say you can never leave and and all these things. But I just said, you know, I'm not coming back. And and I'm following Christ now. And I made the decision that day to get baptized. Um, and just God's kindness for all of that and for his p- even grace to me through through those months 
Um, but the difference of being in Christ, like I think the biggest thing that stands out to me is God himself in my life and how he has led me and how he has, um, how he has so kindly helped me sort through these lies that I believed, the, these ways that I, these doctrines of demons that I fully believed and lived and and to replace them with the truth of his word and and to meditate on his word and to have like the pastors at our church, Redeemer Bible Church have like I've, <laughs> John's the first person who read my testimony. I sent him a 17 page long testimony and he was like, send it over, I'll read it. Just so loving and and walked me through things that I didn't like what kind of I didn't even go into in my testimony my alien abduction experiences but that was during all my demonic stuff but it's like I took that to our pastors and was like can you help me I'm this was this weird experience that I had they've just been so loving um and so God's grace to lead me to even lead me from California to Arizona to this church which was so clear that he was leading me I met my husband here um like he truly is the great shepherd and he truly leads us. And being in his word and seeing how he co uh, continues to convict me of sin and make me more like Christ and sanctify me, like to see that he really will complete the work that he began in us is so amazing to me because he gets all the glory. Like in the new age, it was me doing this and this and this to try to ascend or manifest or attract. No, like this is all God's grace. So any good that you see in me today is truly all a, res a, a result of God and his goodness and his grace, like he truly gets all the glory for any good in my life. And that is so cool to me because I see his kindness to me in my life and, and I'm amazed. So, so yeah. And now to see you um, with, uh, we have a common friend, Doreen Virtue too. Yeah. Uh, and now you guys have been able to share, you know, mm. you, I mean, to teach people to, you know, what's wrong in, in the new age and the whatever the occult or whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, this is a false gospel. And so now you guys are using, you know, social media and the um, everything that we have mm -hmm. out there, right? Like uh, YouTube to uh, to just come and teach people against uh, this teaching. So can you just tell people a little bit about, well, what the podcast is about? What do you guys talk about? Uh, how they can find it? Why did you guys mm -hmm. start it? Yeah. Thank you, Arlie. Um, we started it because at least I can speak for myself. I, uh, I, my heart, like I just celebrated my seven years of sobriety and this, this year really hit me, um, that there are people that I truly care about that are, that through these seven years while the Lord has led me and like, this is beautiful redemption story. They are still, continuing in their in their sin and deception. And that's like hard to see because it does have a snowball effect of sin beginning more sin begin and just, you know, continuing down a path of destruction that ultimately leads to hell. And this is serious. And I people I love are um are in this deception. People I meet whose lives are being destroyed by this deception and then come to Christ and see the difference. Like I I genuinely care for people who are deceived because I get it. I was deceived. I I understand how alluring it is and all these things, but I know that it is poison. It's worse than poison. It leads to eternal torment and hell. It's awful. And so anything that I can do to warn or any of my life that I can show and say, look at this. Do you want this? You don't want this. This is bad. And this is where this leads. Um, and it's not my truth, your truth. This is uh, objective biblical truth. The Bible actually spoke about those things that I was in. And it amazes me how God's word speaks to these things. Like it, it wasn't, it's nothing new. Um, so it amazes me. And I know that the girls, um, Jen was a professional psychic medium before Jesus Christ saved her. Doreen was a new age guru of sorts before Jesus saved her. And they both have this desire of these are lies from the enemy that lead to destruction. And we just want to share, like we want to warn, we want to expose it. And, and show it for what it is, whether it's to warn people in it or to equip saints, to equip the Christians who who are seeing these things and maybe don't know where they come from. Um, so our heart is really to edify um, Christians and encourage Christians and to really see lost people hear the gospel of Christ and, and have the unfruitful works of darkness exposed. 
Um, and it's been just really sweet having that shared connection and being able to talk about these things together. And for anyone listening or watching again, oh, I will make sure to link uh, Jack's account because I also love that mm. in your personal account, you're also teaching and you have uh, short clips of your testimony with old videos from your mm. past life before Christ. And uh, mm -hmm. I think people should go and watch it. So yeah, I'll be linking uh, your social media and then also uh, your website so that people can find the podcast and they can listen to it. Thank um, you. So just moving on to my signature question for the podcast then. So top three books other than the Ooh. Bible that have been helpful for you uh, in your spiritual walk with the Lord um, or being encouraging to, to, uh, to you? Um, I'd have to say Knowing God by J.I. Packer. I'm just now on the um, last chapter. I've been going through a chapter a week with a friend. So it, I was, I knew it's like one of the greats. I, Chuck Holmes, um, one of our dear brothers, he once said to me like something to the extent of life's too short to read good books, read great books. So when I came to pick a book to do with my friend, it was like, well, this is one of the, you know, the classics. It is so good, especially the chapter on the incarnation. Uh, so deep. Anyway, that, um, I haven't finished reading this, but Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices, uh, an old Puritan book, it is so rich and it is so good. What I've read so far is just so helpful in um, kind of seeing um, seeing what the hook is or seeing the hook behind the bait kind of thing, seeing the devices that Satan uses. Um, I'm looking over here because I have all these books that I'm currently going through. Best number three. Well, I am going to have to say Feminine Appeal for um, just womanhood and godly womanhood because I like her approach. It's very friendly and like maybe gentle, but also funny. It's a fun read, but it's it's rich truths about loving your husband. Of uh, I don't have children, but loving your children, um, taking care of your household, but it comes across in a way that is so uh, encouraging. And so that's been really sweet to go through. And now three things that bring you joy. Oh, um, <laughs> my relationship with Christ, like anything, whether it's worship, uh, prayer, being in the word every morning, like Mm, I just love it so much. And even when my flesh pushes against it, doesn't want to, when I do it, it's just like, yes, yes. It's so good to be a Christian. Um, and my husband, which is a good gift from God, I love him so much and how God uses him to redeem broken parts of my past. Um, and then honestly, our church. I, I love our church body. I love our pastors. I love everyone. Like anytime I go to church, it's just like coming – home to my brothers and sisters in Christ and to know that um, with my brothers and sisters in Christ, we'll be together in eternity and just getting a glimpse of that brings me so much joy. So I would say those three. Awesome. And um, my last question, actually, you know, I think uh, it's been very clear throughout this podcast of why uh, it is that we need Jesus Christ. Mm. But again, I always like to wrap it up with the gospel. So anyone who is listening who is not a believer, and, you know, even as believers, we need to be reminded of this. Mm. Why is it that we, even as believers, you know, we need Jesus Christ? Mm, I love it. Well, God is holy. He's perfectly holy, which means he's separate. He's He's not like us. And that's something that we tend to do is try to see God in our image. And that's just... Uh, God is God. He is other than us. And we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned, whether it's, you know, something quote unquote small, like stealing candy when you're little, not honoring your parents, or look at my life, something that most people would say, yeah, that was evil. Uh, we've all sinned. And the just punishment for that sin against a holy God who's given us every good thing, every good gift we've ever had. He gave us life. He gave us breath. He keeps our heart beating. Um, sinning against this God, the just punishment is hell, which is eternal torment. And Jesus spoke about it a lot. It is a very real place that you do not want to go to. And But it is a just and good punishment because God is, yes, people say God is love. Yes, God is love. God is also perfectly just. And it would not be just of God to just wink at sin or just 
let it go. Um, there must be a punishment for sin. And yet God is love. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God incarnated, born to a virgin, Jesus Christ, living a perfect, sinless life that none of us have lived. Jesus was tempted as we are, yet without sin. He he went to the cross. He was mocked. He was scourged. He was he he dealt with so much, and yet he went to the cross, despising the shame. And on the cross, he bore our sin, the sin of those who put their faith in Christ, in our place. And God's just punishment for sin was put upon him rather than us. And he died on that cross, and he rose on the third day, and he is now ascended, seated at the right hand of God as the one mediator, the one go-between, between God and man, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And that looks like putting our faith in Christ alone, Jesus Christ alone for our salvation, not our good works, not anything but Christ alone, and turning from our sin and to Christ. And in all other religions, there is no forgiveness and mercy for sin. There's just working your way, which we can never do. Our righteousness is like filthy rags before a holy God. But God paid the price for us that we could have forgiveness of sins. And when we put our faith in Christ, his righteousness is accounted to us. As our sin he bore, His Christ's righteousness is accounted to us so that it's almost as though God sees us as though we lived Christ's life. Um, which is absolutely amazing. That is full forgiveness. The verse that talks about um, our skin, our sin being like scarlet, but us being washed white as snow uh, is amazing. And just the reality of full forgiveness in Christ, not based on what we've done to earn it, but on what God has done out of his love, that is truly good news. And it is good news, right? And we've heard what the bad news is. We will be mm. separated from God for eternity. And there is only one, two places that we can end. You see, they're in heaven with the Father or in hell for all eternity, mm. uh, separated from the Father. But praise be to God for Jesus Christ. So mm. thank you so, so much, Jack, for joining me. It's been such a joy to, to have you on the podcast. And again, friends, you can find the links here in the description. But before we go, Jack, can you please close us in prayer? Yes, I would love to. Um, Father, you are truly good. And it is amazing to be reminded of your character and your goodness displayed in the cross, in Christ, on the cross, your, your only begotten son um, on the cross for us and the full forgiveness of sins that we have in him that is undeserved. That mercy that you have shown us is amazing. And so, Lord, we thank you for what you have done for us. And God, um, I pray for anyone who does not know you, that they would see Christ exalted and and the good news of the gospel, that there is eternal life and forgiveness of sins in Christ alone, salvation and redemption. And God, I pray for my brothers and sisters, that they would be encouraged and reminded of who you are <laughs> and of how great you are and how you love and how you lead and, and your sovereignty and power, God. We are amazed by you. And I pray for my precious sister, Lord, that you would continue to lead her life. God, I thank you for bringing her here. And I pray that you would continue to use this podcast to bring yourself honor and glory while we are alive here on earth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey friend, thank you so much for watching or listening to this episode. I hope that you were encouraged by the reminder of the grace and mercy that we have received from our Heavenly Father. My prayer is that you can use this podcast as a way to share the gospel with your unbeliever friend or family, or to even encourage a brother and sister in the faith. So make sure to subscribe to this channel or from wherever you're listening from to be notified whenever we release a new episode. Also, like this video and share on your social media if you are on social media. And don't forget that as far as the East is from the West, so our Heavenly Father has removed our transgressions from us. So thank our Heavenly Father for His faithfulness and His love for us. Thank you, friend, and I will see you next time.